Recording in progress. Okay, we'll be starting in four minutes just to get everything ready here. We're sorry about the technical delay. That's okay. Apatim, just to be clear, so you're taking um, over and then you'll be moderating from yes. start to finish here. Okay, yeah. great. Recording in press.
Hello, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar this morning. I hope everyone is well. I hope everyone is healthy amid the pandemic. Uh, a special welcome, of course, I would like to say to His Excellency uh, Amena uh, Yovoli, Ambassador of Fiji to Indonesia, also to His Excellency uh, Tri Tariat, uh, Senior Advisor to the Minister for Foreign Affairs in uh, Political, Legal, and Security Affairs in Indonesia. Uh, also to Badani, Ibu Chalaswari Pramoda Wardani, Deputy uh, for Political Defense, uh, Security and Human Rights Affairs from the Presidential Staff Office in Indonesia, and also to all our speakers in the panel today. I'm Timothy Marbun, and it's a pleasure for me to join you from Jakarta today. Uh, today we will be talking about contribution to peace, uh, Pacific perspective, and I will be hosting this event that will go for the next two hours. Now, a little background about our event. Indonesia and the Pacific Island countries, Fiji in particular, has a strong track record uh, for peacekeeping missions globally. Now, these contribute to global efforts in maintaining peace and security through the deployment of military and police personnel to peacekeeping missions. Now, Fiji, for instance, has been the most significant contributor from the region and developed a reputation as a peacekeeping nation. The peacekeeping capacity is a product of international exposure and experience, which in turn helps to contribute to the maintenance of domestic security and stability, including against the threat of terrorism and violence. Now, considering Indonesia and the Pacific's continuous uh, efforts to build and sustain peace, both at home and also abroad, uh, this time the, mil uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia organized a talk show, a special episode on broad theme of pursuing and creating sustaining peace, both domestically and globally, contribution to peace, a Pacific perspective. Now, allow me uh, to introduce the speakers that have joined us here online. Uh, first of all, we have His Excellency Amena Yovoli, Ambassador of Fiji to Indonesia. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador, for joining us today. Uh, there's Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Colonel Herli Sinaga. She is a former peacekeeper at Monusco Indonesian Peacekeeping Center. We have Major Johnny K. Vere Basaga, Staff Officer, Training Directorate, Peace Support Operations, Fiji Military Forces. We have Anak Agung Banyu Perwita, Professor of International Relations of Defense, uh, Defense Diplomacy Study Program from the Indonesia Defense University. We have Natalie Sambi, founder and executive director of Verb Research. Uh, we have Andika Krishna Yudanto, deputy for international cooperation, National Counterterrorism Agency, Indonesia. So we'll be hearing from all our speakers this morning. Now, to open, we will hear remarks from His Excellency Tri Tariat, senior advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs on political, legal, and security affairs in Indonesia. Good morning, Patri. Morning, Fatim. So, uh, can I start? Sure, the screen is yours, Pat. Thank you so much, Yang Saya Hormati, Ibu Dani, Pak Andika, Prof. Banyu, Pak Sade, Bu Herli, and of course, my dearest friend, Ambassador Pak Amena, and colleagues from Fiji. And distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you, and very good afternoon for of friends in Pacific. I'm pleased to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this seminar. It is timely for us to strengthen our partnership between Indonesia and in the Pacific region, Fiji in particular. As fellow countries in the Pacific region, we share many challenges and interests in common. We share a common heritage of Australian and Melanesian descent. We to share common challenges brought by geography and island and archipelagic nations. We share common challenges of development, education, healthcare, and climate change. These common challenges and interests create a strong foundation and incentives to expand relations. Indonesia and our fellow Pacific countries desire a region that is stable and economically strong. In this very context, today's webinar will discuss two most important issues for Indonesia and Fiji, as well as for all Pacific Island countries. First, on regional and global peace. 
our contribution to the UN peacekeeping operations mandated by the United Nations Security Council. As the two troops and police contributing countries, Indonesia and Fiji has shown their interest to the maintenance of international peace and security. Currently, there are more than 2,700 Indonesian personnel deployed in eight different missions. For more than six decades, our peacekeepers have experienced the change of the nature of the UN peacekeeping from having traditional mandates to more complex mandates. The evolution of the mandates cannot be separated from the fact that in the field, the UN peacekeepers also face multidimensional challenges which complicate their primary missions to help create lasting peace in the host countries. Therefore, Indonesia also recognizes the importance of intellectual contribution to further strengthen the UN peacekeeping. During our membership in the UN Security Council 2019 and 2020, we initiated the adoption of presidential statement on improving safety and security through training and capacity building and resolution 2538 on women in peacekeeping. Those are solid examples of Indonesia's strong commitment to contribute to international peace and security by placing peacekeeping in the forefront of foreign policy. Second, strengthening our measures to address traditional and non-traditional security challenges. We recognize the adverse impact of both traditional and non-traditional security challenges to international peace and security. Therefore, addressing non-traditional security challenges, challenges with cross-border nature, such as illegal drugs, trade, people smuggling, fisheries, crime, and terrorism as are our top priorities. In our view, strengthening legal instruments, as well as the capacity of national law enforcement and international cooperation are key to address such challenges. Because we believe that lasting peace, security, and stability is a responsibility that must be shared together. Furthermore, we are mindful that climate change has become emerging non-traditional security challenge faced by archipelagic and Pacific countries alike. On that note, Indonesia stands ready to force a stronger partnership with the Pacific in addressing issues of common concerns. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for decades, Indonesia and our Pacific countries' neighbors have shared mutual commitment to intensify its contribution to international peace and security. This very webinar is an opportunity for Indonesia and the Pacific to share experience and best practices on the issues of peacekeeping and various security challenges. Finally, I hope that deliberation in this event will further strengthen Indonesia and the Pacific's partnership in the future. Terima kasih. Thank you very much and have a productive webinar. Terima kasih, Pak Tim. Terima kasih juga, Excellency Tuitaria, for your remarks today. Now we will also listen to remarks from Ibu Jaswari Pramodawardani, Deputy for Political, Defense, Security and Human Rights Affairs of the Presidential Staff Office in Indonesia. Good morning, Badani. Screen is yours. Morning. Thank you, Timothy. His Excellency Ambassador Amina Yofoli, Ambassador of the Republic of Fiji to the Republic of Indonesia. His Excellency Ambassador Tritariat, Senior Advisor on Political, Legal and Security Affairs to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. Fellow speakers, colleagues and moderators. Good morning from Jakarta and good afternoon for the esteemed colleagues in Fiji. Before I proceed to the substantive part of my remarks, allow me to first confirm my gratitude to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia for its exceptional initiative in bridging multi-stakeholder perspectives as well as forging closer ties between states across the Pacific region through today's event. Today's topic highlights the, pers uh, the pertinence of peace and stability for the Pacific region with specific focus on the perspectives of Indonesia and Fiji. 
From Indonesia's experience, I can attest that domestic stability is pivotal to be attained first before Indonesia can ex effectively step further to contribute actively to the peacekeeping effort in the regional or international level. Therefore, there are two standpoints that I would like to further elaborate in the context of establishing peace and stability from Indonesia perspective, namely domestic security and international politics standpoints. First, from domestic security standpoints, as Indonesia's facade to the Pacific region, President Joko Widodo realizes the strategic value in ensuring Papua province and West Papua province as inseparable sovereign parts of Indonesia remain stable and increasingly prosperous from time to time. Or in the words of President Widodo, the paradigm to result on a leap of prosperity for the people in Papua province and West Papua province. To this end, myriad breakthroughs have been undertaken by the government of Indonesia one of which is with the issuance of a presidential instruction number nine of 2017 and presidential instruction number nine of 2020 regarding the acceleration of welfare development in Papua province and West Papua province. Within the ambit of said instruction, a comprehensive development framework has been laid out, which is uh, includes not only relevant strategies to proper human resources and economic development, but also concerted measures to maintain security, social harmony, and stability in the two provinces in line with the value of human rights. Translating such framework into action in the wake of certain criminal activities in Papua province, for instance, the government of Indonesia utilizes in its national criminal law instrument with close regard given to the due process of law and human rights value in conducting every law enforcement measure. So, such strategy, despite multiple security challenges with overshadow Papua province and West Papua province, the two provinces re remain stable and enjoy a significant growth in their economic and human development index consistently. The upcoming 20th Indonesia's National Sport Week scheduled to be held in Papua province, which is considered to be the largest sport even in the Pacific region, drawing thousands of athletes and officials to the province, serves also as a testament of Indonesian adhering commitment and accomplishment in ensuring security and stability domestically, which will then trust economic development in two provinces and subsequently the Pacific region. Second, from international politics standpoint, with the proven aptitude and capacity to maintain order domestically, Indonesia then can move to partake a more significant role in the international level to maintain peace and security. To this end, the government of Indonesia holds and remains faithful to its constitutional mandate to take an active part in the execution of world order. Such a mandate is the guiding international politics for Indonesia ever since its independence. With uniform personnel contribution to the United Nations totaling more than 2,500 personnel, Indonesia is amongst the largest contribution of, on the United Nations peacekeeping mission. The very spirit to contribute actively to maintain peace and security in the international level is what I found to be an aligning commitment between Indonesia and Fiji, as Fiji too consistently contributes to the peacekeeping mission by the United Nations. This should work as a virtuous start to further strengthen security cooperation between the two states in the regional level so that the Pacific can ultimately be role model is one of the most impactful and stable region in the world. With that said, I am confident that there are countless models on 
cooperation and ideas that can be discovered through this event. I hope that a fruitful discussion can be produced and more common ground can be initiated between Fiji and Indonesia, which will be the end of the day advances the security, stability, and prosperity of the Pacific region. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ibu Talasari Pamuda Wardani for your remarks on our event today. And now we will uh, move on to uh, the next agenda. But before we move on, I would like to uh, inform participants, uh, especially those who want to submit their questions. Now there's a format uh, that you can use. You can write this format. You, uh, you write your name and then your institution. Uh, and then the question and also who the question is for. So you write your name, institution, question, and who the question is for. So, hello? Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, could you hear me? Okay, sorry about that. So um, thank you very much, Ibu Jalaswari Pramodawardani, uh, for your remarks now. I'm just moving on to the next agenda, but before that, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit questions uh, for the talks today. Now, uh, you can submit it in this format, which is you name your, well, of course, your name and then your institution, your question, and who the question is for. So you write your name, your institution, uh, you write that question and who the question is for, and we will be answering uh, those questions within our panel discussion later on. And there will be a GoPay balance valued a total of 1.5 million rupiah for three participants who are active and have interesting questions to be asked in our event today. So please keep joining in in this uh, webinar and also prepare your questions to be answered later on. Once again, there's a GoPay balance in total of 1.5 million rupiah for three most interesting questions in our event today. Now we will go into the first session discussing investing in peace, security, and stability, the global role of peacekeepers. Now, the speakers in this first session is His Excellency Amina Yovoli, Ambassador of Fiji to Indonesia, Lieutenant Colonel Herli Sinaga, former peacekeeper at Monusco Indonesian Peacekeeping Center, and also Major John K. Verevasaga, Staff Officer uh, Training, uh, Directorate Peace Support Operations in the Fiji Military Forces. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Your Excellency. Good morning. I'm not sure I can hear everyone here. Good morning, Patim. Um, let me just try to move my audio. Hello. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Excellency. Hello. Good morning, my name. I apologize for asking you to do that twice. <laughs> there was just an audio problem there. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for uh, tolerating me here today. There has been a slight audio problem on my side, so apologies for that. Uh, now, thanks once again. Uh, good afternoon to those in Fiji, and thank you once again for joining us today. It is a pleasure to talk to everyone and to hear uh, the stories and also what uh, you have to say about the opportunity that Fiji and Indonesia has done uh, in the past and also what can be done in the future. Uh, my first uh, question, of course, uh, once again, I'd like to repeat that Bula to your Excellency and also uh, Major, thank you very much for joining us. Excellency, Indonesia and Fiji are both uh, troops or police contributor countries in the UN peacekeeping missions. Now, could you share with us uh, Fiji's contribution and what you have found uh, it has contributed to Fiji as well, being involved in the UN peacekeeping ambassador? Well, being in the UN peacekeeping Thank you, host, and I hope that uh, you are hearing me very well. Uh, yes, I'm having issues also on my side, and my apologies in advance if. Uh, there's some connection uh, issues. Uh, before proceeding, uh, let me just allow some protocols you know, to be observed and uh, Ambassador Tritariat, thank you for your presentation uh, this morning. And uh, also Madam uh, Ibu 
uh, providing some very good platforms for discussions uh, this morning. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome and uh, good afternoon to my colleague in Suva, uh, Major Vermasanga. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this, uh, what we may call talk show series on the theme contributions uh, to peace. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to thank, uh, on behalf of the Fijian government, uh, to convey our sincere appreciation to the Indonesian Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for organizing this important platform of our deliberation today, because uh, peace and security are very much issues of the same coin, and uh, and it's important that. Um, at such a critical time as this, um, we need to have some platform of discussions uh, that can be able to, to better prepare us or better equip us in the new way of life, in the new norms that has been introduced to us through this uh, pandemic that is currently facing us. And which of course may affect how we conduct peacekeeping operations uh, in, in the future. So let me just quickly respond to some to the questions that have been uh, uh, raised by our host. And uh, uh, I, I would like to, to emphasize on a few points. First, when uh, Fiji gained independence in 1970, on, on 10th of October, 1970, three days later, it has established its permanent mission to the United Nations. Since then, Fiji's participation in the United Nations has been notably primarily for its active role in UN peacekeeping operations, which began in 1978. Currently, Fijian peacekeepers have served or currently serving, and I'm sure my colleague uh, Major Vera Basara will uh, elaborate defense forces have, but I, I will try to just uh, provide some broad guidance in terms of uh, where we are and how we can be able to effectively participate with Indonesia going forward from here. Fiji have served or currently served in the UN missions such as UNIFIL, uh, UNMIL in Liberia, UNMIS in Sudan, UNMIT in Timor Leste, which is in our region. Kosovo, Sinai, and currently Anmis in southern Sudan. So you will note that the footprints of our soldiers through the peacekeeping uh, boots is also and and through our and also through our police uh, peacekeepers, they are in uh, uh, they have been or are in currently in the major UN regions the hotspots of the world. Um, in uh, 89, one of the sons of the opportunity to command Unifil in Lebanon from 89 to 99. This is our, this is Major General George Conrake, who is currently the president of uh, Fiji troops to protect United Nations officials in Iraq. And uh, we have a long and proud history of sending our forces to the world's trouble sports, ever, as I've said earlier. As of September 2004, of course, the price of peacekeeping, we have to pay. 35 Fijian soldiers had, had been killed in the line of duty while serving on UN peacekeeping missions. As of April 2007, Fiji had 292 soldiers, police officers, and military officers serving in the United Nations operations in Iraq, Liberia, Sudan, and uh, Timor Leste. As of June 2010, Fijian troops are the only UN blue helmets in Iraq. Since 2004, with 121 strong contingent, track record, US 
USP, US peacekeeping operations of professionalism, discipline, compassion, ability, training, and ethics. He said that while we suffered he took pride in Fiji's contributions to United Nations Peace 65 peacekeepers deployed and its contributions have earned it a strong international reputation and nearly 60 Fijians have been killed while deployed over the past four decades. So you can see that the numbers that have been sacrificed through these international peacekeeping commitments continue to rise. Nonetheless, since 1978, Fiji has been the largest per capita contributor to UN peacekeeping operations. This is uh, an, an outstanding achievement given a country of less than 1 million people and for the government to sacrifice its uh, military operations to undertake peacekeeping operations through uh, uh, its global footprint of peacekeeping operations uh, in areas of hot spots has been outstanding. And the UN continues to recognize this achievement with such an outstanding record. Unfortunately, some UN member countries that continue to use or had used the extensive diplomatic and financial resources to deny Fiji's participation in uh, new peacekeeping missions. You might recall that this is coming, this was coming up the last few years where there has been persistent uh, diplomatic uh, efforts to try to deny Fiji's uh, participation, given a record since 1978. Fiji, as always, is committed to the maintenance of peace and security and to a world free of weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. Our leaders have continued to say that there should be no pause in UN endeavors to establish and maintain international peace, security, and stability. Peacekeepers from many contributing countries like Indonesia and Fiji are deployed to conflict zones and are not only working to provide security, but also to disarm, demobilize, and redegrade former fighters to permit the safe and sustainable return of refugees and strengthen human rights and the rule of law. Fiji continues to reaffirm its commitment to the UN. As always, we are for peace, and this is the reason we continue to send many of our soldiers and police officers to serve with the UN's peacekeeping and peacebuilding forces. Many of our, of our peacekeepers have lost their lives, but we have accepted this ultimate sacrifice as our contribution to the unceasing global effort for finding peace and security. Furthermore, while we appreciate the principles of standby force or standby arrangements, as we know, we are at the same time concerned by the fact that those nations who, who are unable to properly equip their forces are mainly from developing countries, including Fiji, and will be marginalized should no arrangement be made to assist them in this area on standby arrangements. If this assistance is not forthcoming, then peacekeeping is confined only to a select few, mainly from developed nations. And I guess this is one of an important issue that Indonesia and Fiji can discuss uh, the importance of standby arrangements where we can be able to reach some form of um, uh, uh, understanding and where we can jointly have uh, uh, a, a platform or a memorandum of understanding to support our joint efforts in uh, global peacekeeping. Furthermore, and also in addition to what I just said on the importance of uh, supporting standby arrangements, in 2005, Fiji acclaims the proposal for a peace building commission. As some of you, my colleagues, might be aware, the Peace Building Commission, there was uh, the content or context of, uh, of resolution uh, ARES 60, ARES 60 180, and uh, Security Council Resolution 1645 of 2005. Um, 
I, 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 I know Ambassador, Ambassador Tariat will be aware of the, this resolution where the GA and the Security Council established the Peace Building Commission. Fiji fully believes in preventative diplomacy. As the older adage goes, prevention is better than cure. It really rings true in this situation. In 2020, the twin resolution A slash RESH slash 75 slash 201 and Security Council resolution S slash RESH slash 2588 of 2020, where the commission was called upon to strengthen its roles in support of nationally owned priorities and efforts in the countries and region under its consideration. I know Pat Tariat had mentioned this in his uh, introductory remarks, but I think this is something that is important for us as a region. When you look at peacekeeping, something that I will touch on, on peacekeeping operations as a region, as Asia Pacific region. We support the UN and other major group initiatives and establishing partnerships with regional groups. You may note that a few years ago, we have what we call in the South Pacific, we came together and uh, formed what was called the Regional Assistance Mission in the Solomon Islands through a peacekeeping and peacebuilding mission, which was mounted by the, the South Pacific member countries, including Australia and uh, New Zealand. And this is something, this is a model that we see in a sub region of the Asia Pacific region that has worked in the South Pacific, a model that we can also uh, use at our regional level, <clears throat> should that discussion arise. And uh, Fiji is always supportive of an enlarged Security Council memberships. I recall these discussions uh, many years ago when we were in New York, and I believe this discussion is still going, uh, going on which we feel that an amicable ag agreement on the expansion of the Security Council permanent and our non-permanent memberships may well present us with new and fresh avenues for global conflicts and solutions. Fiji also would like, you know, to, I, I, I would like to state that we, we have to congratulate the Core Security Council for the momentum and support and application enjoyed by its resolution, landmark resolution 1325. And I'm sure some of you are aware of this resolution. This was adopted on 31, 31st of October, year 2000, marking increased involvement of women in security and peace processes. If uh, you, you look at that resolution on operative paragraph one, it, it says, if I can just uh, restate some of the, of, of the text, it says it urges to ensure increased representation of women in peacekeeping. Operative paragraph four states, further urges the, the Secretary General to seek and expand the role and contribution of women in UN field-based operations, and especially among military observers, civilian police, and so forth. So Fiji is riding on this exciting development since then. And uh, we have initiated uh, participations of women in our, uh, in, in, in our peacekeeping operations, whether through military or police. As an example, as an illustration, the current police commissioner of the armies in South Sudan is a Fijian woman by the name of Unaisi Lutu Buniwanga the first woman to hold the post, as well as the highest ever post by a Fijian within the UN police. So this is the importance of that resolution with this, which the Security Council adopted in uh, 2000. In its wisdom, 30 years ago, the Security Council had put forward this agreement that has enabled the participation of our women in the travel sports peacekeeping operations in yes. the world. No doubt, Fiji has excelled in the peacekeeping goal of the UN Charter, and we remain fully committed to it. And uh, some words of caution and support from a Fijian perspective uh, going forward. Uh, let me just share some of our, some perspectives that we have. Fiji is against exits without strategy. 
It is critical. It, it, it is critical to see positive conclusions of peacekeeping mandates and their impending withdrawals or downsizing. Let me say once again, the issue of exits without strategy is something that Fiji is really concerned with because it's important that withdrawals or downsizing uh, has to commensurate with peace and stability in that country or in that region. Fiji would also like to give credence to the huge investment of goodwill and resources by the UN and the international community and for troop contributed countries like Indonesia and Fiji to avoid double jeopardy to the people trapped, trapped in armed conflict. We would like to recognize that and we would like to give credence to that. Since 1978, our participation, we have lives being sacrificed, we have resources being utilized, commitments being made that has enabled our peacekeeping operations to continue up to this time. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, measures to support troop contributing countries for, from developing countries like Fiji that would be in that would not be in a position to procure equipment for the UN standby arrangements for global peacekeeping operations. <clears throat> Perhaps as I was alluded to earlier, this is an area where Indonesia and Fiji could further dialogue and develop a common platform or, for effective participations in future UNPKO global operations. Fourthly, Fiji supports new measures to strengthen the protective regime of, of the Convention on the security and safety of UN and associated personnel. Its scope needs to reach UN and humanitarian personnel on the ground who need real protection and security whilst attending to the safety and care of civilians. Number five, regional peacekeeping operations initiatives are important platforms for, for global peacekeeping operations. And this platform or these discussions or this talk show may, may, be an may, may pre pre present with us an opportune time to start exploring regional peacekeeping operations in our Asia Pacific region. I had mentioned the RANSI, the Regional Assistant Mission to the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. And we may need to replicate such a concept to the wider region when the need, such need arises. Six, Peace and security guarantees st stability. However, the geopolitical and local influences may differ. Again, this is something that's been alluded to earlier. Issues like climate change, demography, ethnicities, pandemics, like the current pandemics that we are facing right now, natural resources have different influences and outcomes on lasting and durable peace. The achievement of the 2030 SDGs may be at risk without peace, security, and stability. Lastly, our collective voices, Fiji and Indonesia, should guard, should guard against unilateral lobbyists that may inhibit effective participations in global peacekeeping operations. Fiji hoped that the United Nations would deal equitably and fairly with all contributing countries. I'll stop there, um, Mr. Marvin. I I'm sorry that I've worked around a long way to try and establish uh, uh, Fiji's participation in global peacekeeping. And my colleague, uh, Manila Verbasang, I'm sure can go into the detailed statistics uh, later. But uh, 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 we'll be happy to answer to any questions. Yes. Yes, Ambassador. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. It's okay, Ambassador. It's not like uh, we don't have many chances to hear about what you what you presented today. So, and I'm sure we all agree that was very impressive, uh, especially as you state from a nation um, not uh, still under one million people. We have 275 million people here, so uh, one million is just a housing complex for us so <laughs> it's very interesting and very impressive i'll have to say very impressive thank you very much ambassador now moving on as ambassador uh already said 
as Excellency already said, we will hear stories of, uh, about how it was uh, during the mission from Lieutenant Colonel uh, Sinaga and also from Major uh, Brebasaga. So uh, we'll try to hear how it is, how it actually is there uh, in the field. And I'll, I'll, I'd like to give it first to um, Lieutenant Colonel Sinaga. So what can you tell us about your mission and MONUSCO in the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, of your experience there? Yes, Bu Herli. Yeah. Uh, uh, good morning, Selamat pagi, His Excellency, Ambassador, webinar participants, ladies and gentlemen. On this very occasion, I would like to share about how and what is Indonesia from military perspective in the face of UNDPKO. Well, Indonesia is committed to the principles and objectives and shrine in the UN Charter, in particular, maintaining international peace and security. In a glance, I would like to give a big picture of Indonesia's track record in the UN mission. The first Indonesian's contingent in the UN PKO was in 1957 to the Middle East in keeping the peace in Suez Canal, involving Egypt, Israel, UK and France. Since then, its role had decreased in the following years. But after President Yudoyono started his administrations in 2004, Indonesia continued its active participations in UN PKO. To respond to the increasing demand by the UN, Indonesia established the Indonesian Peacekeeping Center, known as PMPPTNI, in 2007, which duties to undertake preparations and training for peacekeepers in accordance with the UN standard and relevant UNPKO duties. At the same time, the establishment of PMPP could help Indonesia enlarge its contribution to the UN in the future. Indonesia also entering its new chapter on contribution to the UNPKO, not only in number of personnel, but also in performance unit. Indonesia also deployed our naval vessels in Lebanon and transport helicopter in Sudan. And since 2007, Indonesia also supports the UNPKO in deploying female peacekeeper. Statistic recorded that up to now, we already deployed more than 47,000 peacekeepers in which 607 of those are female peacekeepers. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia has conducted efforts to optimize its roles in the UNPKO. The question is how we do it. First, by undertaking more active roles. What is this active roles? Uh, firstly, included Indonesia in the standby force contingent in the UNPKO system. So we are now in the list of the UN roster. It means that whenever UN requests for deploying contingent, Indonesia already have the troops. In addition to that, uh, increasing number of Indonesian women participations also an indication of more active role of recent Indonesian foreign policy. And moreover, by encouraging role uh, for civilians or white helpless helmets, for us military, we call ourselves blue helmets, but for civilians, we call them as white helmets to support the development and rehabilitation programs in post-conflict areas. Furthermore, the government of Indonesia also established peacekeeping mission coordinating team, or we call it TKMPP. By doing this, Indonesia showed its vision to develop its roles and participations in PKO, especially in strengthening the roles of three components, military, police, and civilian forces. And through the opening of Indonesian Peace and Security Center, or IPSC, Indonesia is expected to employ more peacekeepers with civilian language to develop, to develop standby force and enhance its rapid deployment capacity. Now we are moving to the challenge that we face. The first one is budget. I'm sure budget constraint is not faced only by Indonesia. Every participation in peacekeeping missions needs a proper readiness to defense sector. This implies that the general defense budget 
we are also more provisions for peacekeeping missions. And the second challenge that we face is language proficiency. Well, English is not our first language, nor our second language. Meanwhile, English is mainly used in the mission area. So it is very imperative for peacekeeper to improve their fluency in English. And the third challenge grows along with the increasing of the demand of female peacekeeper as mandated by UN, mentioning that at least 8% for contingent and 18% for observer or staff officer compositions is female. The challenge is in recruit process, we have to deal with some limitations. The first limitation is before being deployed, a married female military has to submit a permit letter stating that her husband permit her to join a peacekeeping mission. This is a norm that based on religion and culture and we put respect on it. So no permission, no female military resources, and eventually there will be no female military ready to deploy. That's the first challenge. The second challenge is TNI has no enlisted military woman. So TNI has military women with the lowest rank as surgeon. Meanwhile, some of the tasks on the mission area that was designed by the UN for female, especially in the contingent, require enlisted rank. So indeed, in this occasion means that Indonesia cannot fulfill this request. And then Indonesia, also a country which armed forces are not yet allowed the involvement of women in combat unit directly. The exclusions of women from this unit also deprives the female military operational experiences. It is challenged because once we deploy it to the mission area, so we have to have our operational experiences while in our daily tasks, we never have that. And in mission area, the last challenge is female are more prone to abuse and harassment, no exception for female military. I have an experience when I was in Congo in 2019, uh, two local young men tried to rob my bags on my way home from office, but they failed. Then all of a sudden, one of the men hit me two times on my ribs. At that times I wore my uniform, but the local people, they didn't scare of the uniform. They look me more or ten as a weak female rather than as a uniform uh, personnel. So yes, female are more prone to abuse and harassment. These things of, if I may say, incident, it will reduce the interest of the female uh, military to join the, the UN missions. The question now, how we respond to all those challenges mentioned before? For budget, of course, all that we can do is follow through the government regulations and policy. For language proficiency, PMPP implemented two plans. One is during and after pre-deployment tra uh, training, we provide language courses for peacekeepers. And during the selections pro process, what we can do is we make a strict selections for candidates that we will deploy. So we will have the best candidates to deploy to the mission area. What about challenges for female uh, peacekeeper provisions? What we can do? Because the challenges come from the, the problem that based on religion or custom that, that is uh, there in our, in our nations. What we can do is we just give knowledge. We encouraging and increasing interest on PKO. Uh, hopefully that it will help not as significant as what we expected but at least it will open the chances of the increasing of the number of the female military that would like to join the un mission the more the candidates the easier to choose the best and regarding operational experience experiences during pre-deployment training in the peacekeeping center mission background safety and productive cultures are introduced both theory and practice. We train female peacekeepers according to field and situations that they probably will face on the mission area. Sharing experiences from the former female peacekeeper also suggested to level up the, the female military operational experiences. 
uh, webinar participants, last but not least, I would like to quote statement from our former President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono say that to maintain international peace is also a training field for the Indonesian armies to strengthen their professionalism to the level of international standards. I think that's all I can share today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really, very interesting also to know. Uh, we got an extra because we see it from uh, a female side view um, of how it is, it re the reality of it. I'm, I'm sorry to hear the attack occurred to you, but uh, uh, we're happy that you're here with us to uh, tell that story and try to uh, just give a picture of how it is there for female peacekeepers there. Uh, moving on to Major Basaga. So I'm sure that you also have a perspective on how uh, it is so important to increase the knowledge and capabilities for uh, peacekeepers to conduct mandates. So if, if you could share your experience about the uh, peacekeeping missions done by PG. Major Verbezaga. Sorry, I, we can't hear you yet. Hello, Major. Well, I, I can't hear you, but I'm not sure if everyone can hear you. Can anyone hear? No, okay, there's no voice here yet. Is Major Veribasaga muted? Oh no, he's not muted. So obviously you could hear us, Major, but we cannot hear you at this moment. Okay, we're trying to look for a solution uh, by the team here. Okay, so um, can we hear you? Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Okay, all right. Great, we can right. hear you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tim. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Bulavinaka from Fiji. I will move straight into uh, my experiences as a peacekeeper. I have been on a peacekeeping and observer missions uh, with the United Nations. Uh, in Iraq, and also with the United Nations Disengagement Force in the Golan Heights in Israel, uh, and also with UNIFIL uh, in Lebanon. And I, uh, I've also served with a multinational force and observers mission uh, in the Sinai in Egypt. Uh, although it is not a UN mission, it is uh, part and parcel of peace. In all these missions, I have been in appointments uh, ranging from a platoon commander commanding a squad of 30 men uh, to a liaison officer in charge of crossing military personnel, vehicles and equipments over three different international borders up to a position of a commanding officer of a battalion in charge of a contingent of approximately 170 men and women. Uh, my experiences as, as a platoon commander, uh, this is from a lower level, uh, I had to undertake uh, things such as setting up and manning of checkpoints, constructing and manning of observation posts, uh, planning and conducting patrols, writing of daily reports, and uh, providing uh, limited assistance to locals. As an operations officer, I had to oversee the operations of a whole sector of a mission area of operation. And this included uh, posturing of troops and assets uh, in order to mitigate the demands of the situation. Uh, this was done in order to lessen the risks and minimize the threats. And then as a senior liaison officer, uh, my experiences and activities demanded a high level of diplomacy and tech in order to successfully coordinate between international border agencies. As a battalion commander, uh, my role was to a certain degree focused primarily on providing and ensuring 
that the link between the tactical and the operational level uh, was seamless. In my own experiences, there were a lot of challenges that we as peacekeepers uh, faced. Uh, inclusive of these uh, are the physical challenge. Uh, the fact that you are far away from home, uh, in a different climate, uh, the weather is different. Uh, particularly for me, coming from the Pacific, where the weather is uh, tropical throughout the year, and then thrown into an environment where there is snowfall in the winter for about two or three months, is really challenging. Exciting to experience snow, but challenging at the same time. And then you have social challenges. Uh, like my colleague uh, has alluded to earlier, understanding of the local culture, the beliefs uh, and traditions is both phenomenal and eye-opening, but also challenging at the same time. You have language barrier between the locals, you have language barrier between the different nationalities that you serve with. So this is also a challenge. For others, it included acquisition and application of new language skills in mission environments. Experience working in a culturally diverse operating environment, training on the protection of civilians and on sexual and gender-based violence and leader experiences for some. And then you had uh, psychological challenges. Uh, one I can think of right now is uh, prolonged periods away from loved ones uh, can be serious at times, especially when you are serving in a volatile conflict zone. Understanding of the locals uh, is another challenge. Uh, their perception of us, their knowledge of the mandate or the lack of it, uh, can be a challenge uh, for peacekeepers serving in, uh, in, a, in a different country. So I guess training needs to develop and evolve rapidly in order to pre prepare you uh, for situations such as human rights abuse, uh, sexual exploitation and abuse, uh, the protection of civilians, and, and other human rights uh, violations. You have protected conflicts where there's elusive political solutions, increasingly dangerous environments and then there's the rising uh, peacekeeping fatalities and broad and uh, complex mandates so these are some of the, the challenges that that can affect you uh, psychologically uh, the threats i would say would include uh, local or international uh, terror organizations uh, operating in those areas you have local criminal groups uh, perhaps a uh, weak and limited state society relations and then externally supported uh, religious radicalizations that could threat not only you as a person but also the mandate of the mission <clears throat> uh, ways in which peacekeeping has contributed uh, to countering terrorism and preventing uh, violent extremism is I would say by, by supporting uh, communities at the sub-national levels, uh, generating opportunities for community dialogues, mediation efforts and uh, localized peace agreements and uh, reconciliation processes. So by involving, and also by involving more women in peacekeeping through women, peace and security, and also uh, assisting in the protection of civilians. So when this is done, and there are others uh, I'd like to share, uh, which includes uh, peacekeeping, uh, facilitating in the political process, uh, assisting in DDR programs, uh, supporting constitutional process and organization of elections, uh, protecting and uh, promoting human rights, and assisting in the resorting to the rule of law and extending legitimate uh, state authority. So basically, it is not only winning the hearts and minds of the populace, uh, but making a difference in the everyday lives and livelihoods of the local population. <clears throat> if there was a, a message uh, to Pacific uh, Indonesian uh, audiences in particular, how can we uh, contribute to peacekeeping initiatives? Well, I would say, simply put, I would say that we can do one of two things. We can be an active participant or we can be in a supporting role. 
uh, being an active persist uh, being an active participant means uh, one of two things the first uh, you serve in uniform you be part of a uniform peacekeeper meaning you join either a military service or a police service and then be deployed as a uniform personnel thus uh, representing your country in a peacekeeping mission uh, secondly you can serve as a civilian be part of a civilian organization perhaps or an ngo and contribute to peacekeeping and peace building in regions or zones of conflict the second role in 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 a supporting role uh, perhaps you can become an activist uh, an academic an expert even uh, on peacekeeping or in support of peacekeeping uh, you can organize local support and activities in conjunction with uh, local un agencies uh, such as in, on such events such as peace, peacekeeping day memorial or remembrance events uh, seminars such as these conferences and assemblies uh, that aim to to denounce conflict and support everywhere peace not just at the international level but more so at the local and community levels in other words peacekeeping is not just an international obligation it is something that really should be practiced and nurtured locally with a focus on human security and i am encouraged uh, by the comments of lisa Shalland and genevieve Philly of the australian strategic policy institute when they say and i'm and i'm quoting pacific countries could seek to engage more strategically and sustainably with UN peacekeeping by putting in place institutional measures and processes to support engagement. That might include options such as identifying opportunities for deployments and influencing reforms, supporting professional development and leadership opportunities, elevating the training profile of the region, advancing women, peace and security, enhancing regional security cooperation, supporting peacekeepers on operations and on return, and sharing the Asia Pacific's experiences and lessons. Some of the challenges will require working with partners in the region to support training and development." Uh, in closing, I'd like to say that uh, a definite and positive way that we can contribute to peacekeeping initiatives for all member states particularly uh, indonesia fiji and the pacific to support and participate in the new action for plan agenda that was launched by the secretary general in 2018. thank you that's all i have for now thank you major for your presentation there uh, now I'll, i'd like to move on straight to the q a's that have been sent um, to us. So uh, I'm going to just quote some questions here. I'm, I, I, I'd just like to remind all the speakers to, uh, due to time constraints, we'll probably have only one or two minutes to answer these questions uh, per question. So uh, if you would just keep the, um, the answer short, one or two minutes, that would be great. Uh, so we could cover even more questions here and also later on. So the first question is for uh, Major Verebasaga and also for Lieutenant Colonel Herli Sinaga. Uh, it, this comes from Huzaifa Salahuddin from the University of South Pacific. Uh, what are some of the challenges faced in peacekeeping operations? I think you both have answered that. Uh, but the next question is, can Indonesia increase pre-deployment training and capacity building with Fiji? And likewise, as well, share Indonesia experience with Fiji. So I, I guess um, uh, Ibu Herli could start first answering this question. The first question is, uh, what some of the challenges face in peacekeeping operations? And can Indonesia increase the deployment training and capacity yes. with Fiji? Okay. Uh, the challenges as i've mentioned before it will be very like the, uh, from the countryside it can be budget it can uh, from the peacekeeper side it can be the ability our ability like uh the proficiency or uh then how to what is that how to adopt with the the local the local uh custom that we will face it's it's like uh, it's just a small challenge that we will face and regarding whether can indonesia increase pre-deployment training and capacity with uh, capacity building with fiji yes 
I think Indonesia and Fiji already done this. Like we send also our officers in terms of peacekeeper to Fiji and the other way around also. So the answer is yes. So we can like, uh, we can share experience to level up our, our, our deployment training and capacity building with Fiji. Thank you. Thank you, Barely. Moving on to Major Berebasaga to answer the same question, but likewise, uh, can Fiji increase pre deployment training and capacity building with Indonesia? Uh, thank you, Tim. I think I've answered most of uh, the first yes. question, so I'll go straight into the second question. And perhaps uh, His Excellency Ayao Voli can support me on this. Uh, training between uh, Indonesia and Fiji has been ongoing. Uh, and we've been sending officers to Indonesia for training in, in terms of uh, pre-deployment training. And uh, likewise, they have uh, sent uh, officers uh, to Fiji uh, for the same purpose. Uh, what I hope uh, that we continue and perhaps elevate is the fact that uh, hopefully in the next few months, uh, Fiji will uh, open its uh, first uh, peacekeeping school uh, down in Nandi. And uh, looking forward to having more Indonesian uh, Fiji relationship in terms of pre deployment training uh, for UN missions. Uh, perhaps uh, His Excellency uh, Yawoli uh, would like to add more to that. Yes, uh, I guess, uh, Ambassador, you may add more, but uh, I would also want to add a question as well as we try to cover more uh, questions here. So you may add to that, Ambassador. But there's a question for you as well. This comes from uh, Juventus S. Loy from the uh, PMKRI. Uh, his question is, uh, your opinion about which method is the best to create and sustain a secure and stable region? Is it the military method? Is it economic method, social and cultural method or else? And why would you choose that method? So Ambassador. Thank you. Very quickly, yes, uh, Major Verbasang is correct. Uh, we have ongoing uh, programs between Fiji uh, military as well as the Indonesian uh, armed forces in terms of exchanging capacity building and training. Right now, we are expecting some officers from Fiji to come over for training for, for degree purposes in, in the next uh, few years uh, through TNI. They have allowed this uh, uh, to take place. Uh, we will continue to strengthen this and we will need to to try and um, work uh, to further strengthen the relationship between our two countries particularly the armed forces in the area of peacekeeping uh, we have a new training school in in fiji uh, for peacekeeping operations and indonesia has a very dedicated school as well i'm sure we can cross fertilize and have and share experiences in this area where some of your personnel can deliver lectures in, in our school back in Fiji to learn from your experience. And uh, the, second, uh, the second question, which, uh, which relates to what method that works better, uh, I, I think diplomacy works better, uh, whether it's peacekeeping uh, in, in the boots of our soldiers or, or, or whether it is an economic cooperation, it's a combination of that. I think that's, it's, that always brings parties uh, together. To, to a common uh, solution. As I said in my presentation, the causes or the drivers of instability are different. It depends on, 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 on the geopolitical situations. Our region is totally different from the other, the African regions. So the drivers or the causes of instability are totally different. So we need to address specific issues that, speci that have specific resolutions that can be able to provide long lasting solutions and durable solutions. In our region. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And I would like to also thank you for joining us in this session, Ambassador Amenayo Voli, Ambassador of, of Fiji to Indonesia, also Lieutenant Colonel Harley Sinaga, former peacekeeper at Monusco Indonesia Peacekeeping Center, and also to Major uh, Vere Basaga, Staff Officer Training Directorate of Peace Support Operations Fiji Military Forces. Thank you very much for sharing and giving your insights uh, on this matter. And it's, I'm glad that to have um, talked to everyone here. Uh, it's not, we don't get many chances to hear what has been said here. So thank you very much. Thank you again. Uh, those are the speakers for our first session. 
Uh, and thank you again for the questions. We are we apologize that we cannot answer all the questions due to time constraints. But for the speakers, if you feel that you can answer through Zoom, we invite you to please do that and type in your answers through Zoom. Now, moving on, I am going to invite to the speakers of my uh, second session. Uh, once again, don't forget to submit your questions. Uh, three questions will be chosen. There's a total of 1.5 million rupiah for three participants uh, with the best questions that will be given in the form of GoPay. Moving on to our second session, therefore, I would like to invite the speakers in this session. Uh, first of all is Anak Agung Banyu Perwita, Professor of international relations and or uh, and defense defense diplomacy study program indonesia defense university uh, there's also natalie sambi founder and executive director of verb research and also andika krishna yudanto deputy for international cooperation national counterterrorism agency in indonesia good afternoon everyone good afternoon good morning and good afternoon Hi, good, good morning. Good afternoon. So I would just like to remind all the speakers, especially those who have uh, a, a, a slide presentation in the session, uh, that we have very limited time. So uh, the maximum time for the presentation would be 10 minutes. If it's eight minutes, it's even better. So we have more times to answer the questions. So uh, I'll be first, I'd like to let uh, Prof Banyu to start off. Uh, about how you see these peacekeeping operations and also uh, the implementation of mandates and and you've heard what uh, we've heard from the first session so what is your take on that professor okay thank you very much timothy uh due to time constraints allow me just to underline what uh his excellency patriotariat ambassador and also ibu jaleswari have mentioned about the uh, peacekeeping operations and then security and stability. Uh, my, my first point that I would like to share with you all is that we have to understand that security is a very relational phenomena. And I think this is uh, very clearly uh, mentioned by His Excellency uh, Ambassador Tritariat and also Ambassador Fiji that we have to be able to, let's say, in to some extent to reconcile the uh, traditional and non-traditional security issues and i think this is quite important for all us for all of us because peacekeeping operations is not only dealing with let's say traditional issues of security but also with the non-traditional security issue so i think this is the first point that we have to take it uh, we have to take into account that the role of the P, uh, PKO is very not only very important but also very crucial in order, let's say, to create peace and security. Then, uh, of course, in order to be able to reconcile this uh, issue, these two issues, I think the and I do agree with uh, the ambassador of Fiji that we need a very strong cooperation, either bilateral, yeah, regionally, and also multilaterally. And I think. This is something that we have uh, we have uh, considered, and we uh, something that have been uh, mentioned uh, very uh, important by the ambassador. So, in order to that, I think we have also to 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 offer a kind of response in order to be able to have more effective uh, peacekeeping operation. First of all, in my opinion, if I can share with you, is that. We need a we need a very a strong domestic level response. What is that? What I mean by domestic level is that any member of the countries in the PKO should have a very clear and coherent foreign policy and defense policy. Why? Because whether we like it or not, whether we agree or not, when we talk about peacekeeping operations, we talk about a very coherent foreign and defense policy of any specific uh, member of the country so in the context of indonesia for, exa for example this is a, a very uh, clear indicator that uh, sending pko is the very clear implementations of our foreign policy of bebas active that first of all second of all domestically and i also would like to underline what uh, uh, let's call sinaga has mentioned she quoted about the uh, statement from uh, president, our former president Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, 
And this is about our domestic issue. Sending PKO can also become an indicator of increasing our uh, professionalisms of PNI, but also in terms of strategic and economy. This is also an event to propose to increase our defense industry, because as we may aware that Indonesia has also sent our armor vehicle, ANOA and Komodo, uh, and uh, this uh, armor vehicle were, uh, were, were the product of our PT Pindad. And I think this is quite important for Indonesia to further increase, uh, to elevate our technology to the uh, international level to send our uh, defense industry. So that is the uh, on the domestic level. On the state to state cooperations, I also would like to underline that bilateral cooperations between one with the other are also very important. So in this context, I would like to underline that the cooperation between Indonesia and Fiji uh, may also be, become a very clear example on how we can increase the bilateral cooperations in the context of PKO. We have Indonesia Peace and Security Center in Sentul, and I do agree with uh, Ibu uh, Sinaga that probably we can have a kind of training, joint training together uh, to send, uh, for example, Fiji uh, PKO mission to Indonesia, to Sentul, in order to, to, to have a kind of uh, uh, pre-preparation before sending to the, uh, let's say, to the uh, specific mission. The next, call, uh, the next uh, issue that I would like also to over is to, especially to MOVA, to our Kemlu, is to have a, a more, let's say, a stronger regional cooperation among, not only among the member of the ASEAN, but also the other countries in Pacific Island. So in this context, we, we do not only talking, we are not only talking about regional cooperation, but also talking about trans-regional cooperation between Southeast Asian countries in one hand and uh, let's say Pacific uh, countries on the other hand. And I think Indonesia can play a very important role, active role in by using our IPSC in Sentul, for example. And I think this is one of the uh, very good issue uh, to be used by MOVA and also by Ministry of uh, Defense of Indonesia to have a more active and a more effective defense diplomacy. Yeah, so I think I would like to underline about the importance of defense diplomacy in our foreign and also defense policy. Last but not least, because again, this is about uh, time constraint, I would like to also to uh, uh, underline about the importance of the role of the global players. Whether we like it or not, the role of global players, uh, the permanent five of the UNSC are very important. So I think we need to have a very important uh, uh, to strengthen cooperation between us and them. So this is the time for us to have a, a better collaboration in order to be able to achieve the main goal of the uh, PKO so that we can, let's say, have a very a good, long and sustainable uh, peace in our uh, world today. So I think this is uh, something that I would like to share with you. Uh, due to time constraint, and I will be, I will be very open and happy to uh, comment and respond to any questions that uh, we may have later on. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you. Hope that will Rahman. be very useful. Thank you, and we do have questions lined up for you uh, later oh, on. Yes, so, thank you. okay, thank you very much. Now, moving on, uh, moving on to Natalie. Hi, uh, Natalie. Good to see you again, uh, Nat. The Pacific is undoubtedly one of the most strategically important regions in the world. Now, can the Pacific Island countries continue to explore the potential for cooperation and collaboration in order to strengthen stability, security, and keep the peace? Hello, Natalie. I don't, I don't think I hear your voice. All right. Okay. Sorry. Hello? Yeah, we lost you again. All right. Are we good? Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. You. No problem. All right. Well, thanks so, everybody for inviting. Yeah. So, did you get the question or I, I, I could repeat it for you? Yeah, thanks. 
Okay, so the, the Pacific is undoubtedly one of the most strategically important regions in the world. Now, can the Pacific Island countries continue to explore the potential for cooperation and collaboration in order to strengthen stability, security, and keep the peace? Oh, definitely. I think, you know, as uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Sanaga um, and Major um, said earlier, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for cooperation, not just between Indonesia and Fiji, uh, but also with countries like Australia. Um, and actually, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, today, you know, in addition to the excellent points that uh, Professor Banyu has brought up about the foreign policy objectives of peacekeeping, but also the domestic ramifications for countries like Indonesia and Fiji, where the military has played a really important role within politics and society. I think there are some really interesting and critical points about the way in which peacekeeping is conducted overseas and the way that actually affects uh, civil military relations back home. So if I if I can riff on that a little bit, Tim, can I can I go ahead a bit on that direction? Sure, sure, no problem. Sure, sure. So one of the things I wanted to bring up is really how peacekeeping impacts on civil military relations in countries like Indonesia um, and Fiji. You know, when I say civil military relations, what I'm really talking about is the relationship between civil society and the armed forces. But what we're also talking about normatively is civilian control over the military and the idea of professionalizing a military force, again, whether that's Indonesia or the Fijian armed forces, it's about the acceptance of civilian leadership, accountability for actions, checks and balances. But I think in particular for Indonesia, I would add that maintains, that includes maintaining a balance between internally focused and externally focused elements of the military. And I think that's relevant for Fiji as well. In this case, between land and maritime for Indonesia, strengthening civilian capacity, again, for both countries, and strengthening the role of police. So where does peacekeeping fit in with that? Well, if the idea is if peacekeeping is to professionalize forces and to help change the culture within each of those militaries, to professionalize them into providing security services in a way for politics, um, then that's an important element of peacekeeping. And we know that there are some lessons learned that have had positive effects um, in both militaries as well. But if we take the example of Indonesia, if we're trying to change the military culture in Indonesia um, into something which is a domestic interest like expanding maritime defenses, uh, incre increasing the capacity of the TNI, then continuing to send land-based Indonesian forces on land-based peacekeeping operations continues to privilege a land-based centric military culture. So in one sense that it's good for the TNI and the Fijian military to keep sending those troops, and at the same time, there's a balance that needs to be struck, uh, you know, with the pursuit of Indonesia becoming a more maritime aware and a more maritime strengthened country. So again, I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just a question here of acknowledging the complexity um, and the way and the role that these militaries can play within their countries as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the other thing I wanted to point out is in terms of maintaining a good civil military relationship is utilizing as far as possible um, police forces on peacekeeping operations as well. Um, we know that a lot of Indonesian peacekeepers have been police and in particular have been women, um, but maintaining a strengthened police force is part of a good division of labor in both countries, in Indonesia and in Fiji as well. Ironically, a lot of police deployments from Indonesia have been from the mobile brigade or BRIMOB, so it's mostly a paramilitarized force, but this is a potential area where we could consider sending more other kinds of civilian police, whether it's from Indonesia and Fiji, together with the Australian Federal Police, I think that's another area where we could certainly um, have a lot more cooperation. And I'd be keen to see that growing once Fiji opens up its peacekeeping centre as well, to provide a greater balance, not just between military personnel, but also uh, police peacekeepers, and um, as uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sadag pointed out, white hats as well. I think that would provide a very good mix and strengthening of all of those security actors particularly with the Indonesian and Fijian context. And I think a more robust, stable and healthy balance between security actors domestically makes for really effective peacekeepers overseas. And in those ways, Indonesia and Fiji and other Pacific countries can maximize their kind of contributions in the pursuit of global security. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of Indonesian peacekeepers uh, already contribute to CIMIC, the civil military cooperation. Was this what you're, uh, in particular, what you were talking about, that this needs to be strengthened? And maybe you, you could tell us probably uh, there are best practices, international practices in PKL 
uh, in developing this and also uh, sending the country's own capabilities and civil and military relations. I think the really important thing to remember is that while there are best practices for civil military relations and PKO, some of this has to be seen in the context of each country. Indonesia's mm -hmm. historical trajectory means that it has a different place of the military in its society. Um, so I think a lot of the lessons learned that have come from South American countries, African states, um, those are the lessons learned that I think would be most useful. And there's some new studies on Uruguay, Argentina, those kinds of countries that I think have more relevant um, socio-political context to understand how Indonesia can go forward, not just not necessarily just what we get from Western countries. Okay, so uh, another thing is, what, what do you see in the increasement of Indonesia's role uh, for peace and security for its domestic politics, bilateral and multilateral ties uh, with the rest of ASEAN in the region, also leadership in the larger Indo-Pacific region? Yeah, it's really interesting. I'm surprised up to now that there hasn't been more there haven't been more developments in the regional peacekeeping force. Um, Indonesia is so well placed to lead on this, particularly because of the center in Central. Um, I, I would assume that some of the, the lag in this is to do with the regular constraints of working within ASEAN, making sure that each military has a level of familiarity and interoperability. So I think there are some practical constraints there, um, but certainly this is something that you know, other countries in the region, such as New Zealand and Australia, can find a supporting role but I definitely think there should be a potential there for a peacekeeping force that is ASEAN based. We know from the experiences in East Timor that having Malaysian um, and Thai and Filipino peacekeepers was of good comfort for Indonesian forces when they went into East Timor in 1999. And similarly, you know, you can reduce friction or some of the lessons learned from our military participants today talking about cultural differences. There's certainly an ease when having Southeast Asian peacekeepers dealing with the Southeast Asian context. All right, thank you, Nat, for answering those questions. Now, allow me to move on to uh, Pandika. Pandika Krishna Yudanto, Deputy for International Cooperation, National Counterterrorism Agency, Indonesia. Uh, Pandika, based on your observation, uh, what are the most disruptive force against peace? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Certainly, it's a pleasure for us to, to be here today. Uh, again, uh, I do have a presentation with me. Uh, mm. Allow me, uh, allow Mr. Uh, moderator uh, to provide that uh, uh, presentation. Uh, again, I would like to thank uh, the Foreign Ministry as well as Compass TV for hosting this important We Talk uh, series on contribution to peace, a uh, Pacific perspective. Now, looking into uh, my next slide. Uh, it is that if there is two global indexes that is quite important to uh, to look into one is the global peace index uh 2020 and the global terrorism index 2020 now uh, if we're looking at it from a uh, the standpoint of uh, the peace index there is a deterioration uh, and it focuses on three important elements domains which is the safety and security aspects ongoing conflict and also militarization. So again, the peace index looks into how countries are looking into their safety and security, ongoing conflict and also militarization. Now with the Asia Pacific, it was noted that uh, for 2020, uh, there's a slight deterioration. There's an increase, uh, there's an increase of death from internal conflict within the countries in the Asia Pacific. And also there is the, there's an increase in military expenditure. But when we're saying when they're saying increasing military expenditure, there is also a weaker commitment to UN peacekeeping funds. So again, uh, although this is a side deterioration, but uh, again, this is what came out as a uh, global peace in that index outlook in 2020. Uh, again, countries within that region that is the first most peaceful is New Zealand, second is Singapore. But then again, we're looking into uh, countries that has quite a large uh, deterioration and it is actually Indonesia and Timor Leste because of internal and external conflicts and also because of political instability. And this was done, uh, this index was done looking into the year 2019, where for example, Indonesia was having its, its election year. So again, there is that sort of political instability 
And if you're looking into Indonesia right now, it's uh, rank 49, but still considered as a high state of peace. So again, Indonesia is still at the peaceful state. Uh, and when we're looking into the uh, Global Terrorism Index uh, for five, there's a welcoming development that for five consecutive periods, that the number of deaths from terrorism have decreased uh, before in 2018 it was 15%. Now it's lower to 13.8% in 2019. And when we're looking into uh, the countries within the Asia Pacific region, 11 out of 19 countries uh, have improved in the in the impact of terrorism uh the largest deterioration again when we're looking to the peace index new zealand was at the top notch of being the second most peaceful country in the world but because of the uh inc crisis incident uh there they had sort of deteriorated within the global uh terrorism index uh and if we're looking at uh the best improvement within the Asia Pacific region, you're looking into China, the Lao PDR, Malaysia, and also Vietnam, and those countries that are still considered most affected by uh, tourism is within the region is Philippines and Thailand, where some countries, for example, within the region has no impact of tourism, such as Singapore, North Korea, Mongolia, and Timor Leste. But again, if you're talking about North Korea, Within the Global Peace Index, they are ranked as one of the lowest countries uh, uh, based on the peace. Now, again, when we're looking into how there is a correlation between peace and also terrorism, uh, the, GT, uh, the Global Terrorism Index 2020, uh, as, uh, looking into that, stated that the conflict as the main primary drivers of terrorism. So again, 98% of deaths do uh, uh, of, of terrorism deaths is uh, is where place where countries have uh, most conflicts. Now, looking into that, uh, my second uh, presentation is looking into what is the Asia Pacific dynamics. Uh, for the interest of time, I will go to the next slide, which is looking into one of the. Uh, it, has, it has been an ongoing debate, uh, uh, which is. Uh, if we can move on to the next uh, presentation so, uh, slide. Uh, we're looking into as there is a notion that conflict is the primary driver of terrorism. So again, the question is, does terrorism exist in Papua? My own answer would be probably be yes. Uh, if we're looking at the uh, data on violence in Papua since 2010 to 2021, as illustrated by the uh, Papua Task Force, of the Gajah Mada University that was published on the 5th of May uh, 2021 this year. Uh, if you're looking at it from since 2016, actually there is, this, there is a rise and increase where cases of violence are being perpetrated by the so-called uh, criminal uh, armed groups in Papua. And that has risen uh, from 2016 to uh, 2021. Uh, in 2021 alone, uh, the cases uh, that relates to the uh, uh, criminal armed group of Papua itself uh, is also rising as, as, and almost in the same number. If you're looking at the number of deaths or victims uh, from the uh, cases, uh, most of which 70% are civilians, uh, then a small, very small percentage, which is 7% is the criminal armed group themselves, but there is also uh, victims of deaths uh, within the military as well as within the police force. Uh, uh, and this is where we see that there is, although we have uh, noted that they are a uh, criminal armed group, but again, what can Indonesia do further uh, to ease uh, the problem that is existing in Papua itself? So uh, the next slide is uh, focused on, there is a need for us uh, to have a paradigm shift or a game changer, and that is looking through the lenses of a CT perspective in Papua. Uh, whereas I think number one, uh, we should still maintain and sustain the development approach in Papua. Uh, again, uh, it is a matter of principle where the coordinating minister has also mentioned that the special autonomy status should always be provided to the Papua. 
also the presidential instruction number nine of 20, uh, 2019, which was also mentioned by Ibu Dhani uh, from the presidential uh, palace was also mentioning about there is still the need to push further for uh, for uh, welfare within Papua. Uh, there is also uh, the need to uh, get more participation of Papuans within their own politics and also uh, provide programs such as Saudara Papua, uh, where all the Papuans were provided for uh, with education within uh, uh, important universities in Indonesia, and also recruitment processes for Papuans uh, in the public sector, which should always be maintained and sustained as part of, part of a development approach in Papua. The second thing that we can uh, also look is uh, the means for using law number five of 2018 on terrorism, on anti-terrorism, which when we look at the uh, uh, violence that is being perpetrated by the criminal armed group, it does uh, meet the definition of terrorism as provided for under that anti-terrorism law. It is also a means for a discriminate approach, which is focusing uh, on the means for uh, in, in some matters, Indonesia has been focusing uh, on religious-based uh, uh, terrorism, but then we could also look into other means such as separatism issue as part of the uh, uh, indiscriminate approach towards uh, the use of the law number five of 2018. Uh, and again, uh, what's, what is also uh, beneficial is that when we're uh, using the law number five of 2018 on anti-terrorism, the criminal liability also extends to legal entities. Whereas if you're using the old uh, penal code, uh, you're only focusing on the individuals that are perpetrating crimes. And again, if you're uh, using law number five of 2018, the uh, human rights principles is enshrined in that particular law uh, from the standpoint of law enforcement as well as the means for prevention of terrorism. So uh, another important aspect is that only by using law number five of 2018, looking into that sort of uh, perspective is the use of law number nine of uh, 2013, which is the means for listing of individuals and entities that are presumed uh, to have committed uh, terrorism crimes, including uh, terrorist financing. Now, again, this is a uh, law that stipulates the importance of a court decision in the due, as a means for due process when we are listing individuals and entities. And also, uh, when we have, when we're listing those individuals and entities, uh, it is part of an administrative sanction rather than a penal sanction and there is also the right for them to uh, attain remedy. Now, the importance of using the uh, law number five of 2018 and also the law number uh, nine of 2013 on terrorist financing is that it will foster international cooperation. And that fostering international cooperation could also uh, be regarded as international judicial cooperation, but also international uh, cooperation where uh, there is a need for countries to share uh, their list of individuals and entities that they assume or suspected or known as terrorists uh, and therefore that would garner uh, means for uh, mitigating, you know, for example, terrorist financing. And that is enshrined in, for example, in the uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1373 and also as part of the uh, Recommendation 6 of the Financial Action Task Force or, or, or the FEDF. So again, me, Pandita, we have one, one minute left. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Very brief on this one. And I think this is where, uh, again, looking into a lens of uh, terrorism, there is that uh, means for garnering international cooperation, looking into the situation in Papua. Now, of, uh, apart from that, I've, um, I'm also uh, uh, heartened by the fact that Professor Banyu in my last presentation is looking into the food for thought on how we can correlate between peace and also uh, our measures to a city, uh, city strategy approach. And that is the uh, latest text that came out from uh, uh, the IRF meeting 
in 2019 that adopted the uh, IRF statement on preventing and countering violent extremism conducive to terrorism. This is a document that can be utilized uh, to garner that interregional cooperation between Asia and the Pacific, in particular, in means for uh, the prevention of terrorism, something that can be thought up, not only looking from the lenses of peacekeeping, but something that could also work as means for uh, decreasing the uh, problems related to terrorism within the region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bandika. Uh, now I'm, I'm I'm going straight to the questions that have been submitted to us uh, for the speakers. Um, the first question, this is for all the speakers. Now um, we might I, I might give this to uh, Prof. Banyu first, and maybe Natalie would like to add on that. This is from Hino Samuel Jose, Universitas Pembangunan Nasional Veteran Jakarta. Indonesia and ASEAN is well known for its pacifist settlement of dispute uh, when encountering conflicts. Now, considering the polarized Asia Pacific because of major power competition, should Indonesia alongside with PIF revisit to rethink their look east policy to prepare for the unanticipated further effects of these emerging issues in Asian peace. Prof. Banyu. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think that is one of the uh, very good questions here in, in the context of uh, on how we can, let's say, uh, further strengthening the regional cooperation. And I just would like to, 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 to put into the uh, attention to all of us that ASEAN has already produced what we call as ASEAN Outlook on Indo-Pacific. Uh, this document has been uh, was produced in 2019, and I think this can be a kind of instrumental instrumental bridge in order to connect not only ASEAN members uh, countries but also the other grid powers. So in that context, ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific can be used in order, and I think this is something that uh, Natalie has mentioned about maritime cooperations, maritime uh, security issue. That ASEAN outlook in the Pacific uh, document can be used in order to further uh, strengthening the maritime cooperation, not only between ASEAN countries, but also grid powers, and also uh, to, uh, to, to, to include the Pacific countries. Because when we talk about uh, ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific, we are not only talking about Indian Ocean in one hand, but also in uh, Pacific Ocean. But of course, in that context, we are talking about both uh, oceans. Uh, uh, Indian mm -hmm. and uh, Pacific. So I think once again, uh, to wrap up, uh, this kind of uh, document can be used by all of us uh, in the region, not only to, again, to strengthen the cooperation, maritime cooperation, but also to ensure a more uh, sustainable uh, stability and peace in the region. I think uh, that will be my response. Uh, thank, thank you, you Timothy. Thank you, Prof. Now I'm uh, moving to Natalie. What is your response to this, Natalie? Look, I think I agree there should be more initiatives for, for Indonesia to be able to engage the Pacific and engage the voices of smaller and middle powers. I think that sometimes gets lost when we talk about the dynamics of great power rivalry and potentially conflict that will result from tensions between the United States and China. I would like to play devil's advocate um, with Pat Banyu's point, though, about the ASEAN outlook. It was such a hard document to reach at the end of the day. And what I would like to ask is, why are we not relying on mechanisms like the ADMM Plus, which already includes not only ASEAN and promotes ASEAN centrality, but includes other actors in the region, particularly the United States, China, Japan, Australia, so on and so forth. So we have existing mechanisms, and I'm just a bit cautious about trying to get more cooperation out of a new one. Having said that, I do acknowledge, as Prof, as, um, Prof Banyu points out, at least the uh, AOIP includes the Indian Ocean as well. So I think that would definitely be something we could look at, particularly since Indonesia has sent peacekeeping operations with the Navy, particularly its corvettes to assist the Lebanese Navy, maybe that's an area we could look at a little bit more. All right. Thank you, Nat. Um, moving on to a question for Bandika. Um, I think this is from Muhammad Al Molana from Brawijaya. Uh, in the midst of global pandemic outbreak, what is Indonesia's major role and contribution in sustaining a secure and stable region? Uh, and how Indonesia utilized its South Asia regional power to stabilize Pacific region by implementing its foreign policy. I guess uh, Prof. Banyu could also answer to this, but uh, maybe you, Pandika, I, I guess in your area, this would be how to um, 
maximize the Indonesia's role and contribution also in taking part in counterterrorism in the region? I guess that 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 would be the question for you. Right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, and I, it's really a good question what Indonesia can contribute. Uh, looking from our perspective, uh, coming from the National Counterterrorism Agencies, among the documents that I've mentioned is the RF statement on the prevention and means for countering uh, violent extremism, and that is a you know there's a that's a quite a large uh, geographical footprint uh, looking into the Asia Pacific region, uh, thoroughly through the ASEAN Regional Forum. But we're also working through the ASEAN mechanisms, where, where it's uh, Natalie has mentioned about the ADMM. But there's also another uh, sectoral bodies that is working in the region, and that is the ASEAN Minister Meeting on Transnational Crime, which among them discusses about the uh, uh, counterterrorism issues. One of the documents that the Indonesia has initiated is the ASEAN Plan of Action to uh, prevent and counter the rise of radicalization and violent extremism, and also uh, the uh, work plan that is uh, for the implementation of such. Uh, ASEAN uh, Regional uh, Plan of Action, and that is the Bali Work Plan. So this is a footprint that is being utilized within ASEAN and also through the uh, greater region, through the uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, which is uh, means for applying, uh, uh, means for a peaceful and stable region, uh, and means to mitigate uh, uh, terrorism. So that is my short answer to that. That's uh, the contribution of Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you, Pandika. Uh, Prof. Banyu, I think this next question, so we could cover more questions here. Uh, it's from Jadutan Waromi. Uh, a little, uh, this is not exactly about peacekeeping, but of course, this is an issue of the region. Uh, when we discuss the Pacific region in international relations, the main issue that will be dominant is about climate change that threatens the sustainability of the lives of people from the countries in this region. Uh, in this case, the volume of seawater sea will rise every year, which is predicted to sink some of the countries in the region. What solutions do you offer to this? Uh, I, I guess in terms of international relations in the region and what is the mechanism of solving it? Okay, thank you very much. Another good question now. I like it. Uh, I like this very much. Yeah. And I think this is uh, something that I would like again to underline Yeah, that we need to reconcile to reconcile the issue, the cooperation, uh, the issue of cooperation between traditional and non-traditional issue. And climate change is one of the important issue that we have to take into account on the non-traditional issue. And once again, I would like to over all of us to uh, read and to, let's say, to understand the concept uh, uh, of the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. And one of the one of the aspects that uh, ASEAN outlook on and on Indo-Pacific would like to, to 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 focus on is that the cooperation on climate change. So I think this is the time, and I think I would like to give this. Uh, and I would uh, my idea is uh, to our Ministry of Foreign Affairs to expand the uh, coverage of ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. So once again, uh, something that I have I have mentioned earlier. One of the most important issue on the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific is the issue of maritime cooperation. And once again, climate change, yeah, on the, uh, uh, let's say, in our maritime issue, uh, environmental issue, and so on and so forth, was one of the main important uh, focus that we can emphasize. Yeah. So I think this is our time uh, to uh, expand the cooperation's uh, coverage, not only between, once again, ASEAN members, the great powers, but also to go beyond to the eastern part of our region. And that is, here we are talking about uh, Pacific countries. So again, that will be my response. So I think uh, I would like to, uh, I think these questions can also be uh, responded by the MOVA in order to uh, expand our uh, document on ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. And I think this is something that I, I do agree with Natalie, and this is the time for us to uh, implement outlook on Indo, uh, AOIP into a more concrete uh, actions. So I think this is the time for us to, to, hand, uh, to hand in hand together to, to, to solve our 
non-traditional issue of security. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you, Prof. Banyu. I really wish we had more time with us. However, it is a Friday and uh, yeah, time is a very time constraint on a Friday. So I'd like to thank everyone. Prof. Banyu, thank you very much. Natalie from Verb Research, thank you very much. Thanks, Bandika yeah. from BNPT. It was great to have everyone here. Hopefully, uh, the time constraints that we have here is only a reason that we could meet again in another event. So I have more talks there. Thank you very much to all the speakers. And I hope you all have a nice day. Stay safe wherever you are. Now, uh, we also have, uh, for the questions that have been sent, we have chosen some winners from the, uh, foreign, um, for, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has chosen three best questions. I'm gonna read them here. Uh, they will all receive, well, each receive 500,000 in the form of gold base, so a total of 1.5 million. Uh, first of all is Huzaifa Salahuddin from the mm -hmm. University of South Pacific. There's also Juventus Esloy from PMKRI and also Jeduton Waromi from Pacific. Now, please contact our administrators here through Zoom. So you, uh, we encourage you to contact the administrator through Zoom so we can uh, uh, send you the gift or transfer it through your GoPay. So please do that. And that was the whole discussion for today. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, most especially Ambassador uh, to Fiji, uh, Excellencies that have all joined us. To all the speakers, thank you very much for your time. However, that's all the time we have today. Once again, thank you. I hope that you all stay safe, stay healthy wherever you are, and we'll meet you again in another chance. I'm Timothy Marbun. We'll see you again. Bye-bye.